Thank you. I'm very conscious we've got lunch. I'm between you and lunch. Um, I have quite a lot to share, um, but it really dovetails onto what we saw in the previous session. I think this might be uh, a, a good, a good complement to that. So, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm from the UK. Um, I like complex systems. I spent a career delivering complex systems, and a complex system, in my view, never finishes. You're always adding new features. It takes a long time to create, and it never really finishes. Um, so think about your critical infrastructures. Think about your national defense systems. They're big systems. Um, I now run a company uh, I'm d uh, looking after software risk. So a lot of the things that you hear in OWASP I promote, things like SAM, um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to de describe in this conf is a talk, I, I contribute to and I promote. Um, I like open source software. I contribute to open source software. I'd love you to contribute to some of my open source software to make it better. Uh, I'll give you a link at the end to where my repos are. Um, I also like engaging in the next generation of future engineers. So that's what I call STEM ambassador in the UK. So trying to encourage people to take technology, take science, take maths, and build a career out of it. Um, I think we all recognize here what a wonderful career opportunity it is. I think we need to share that. And the way I do that is going to schools, to mentor people, mentor students, introduce them into secure coding, um, as well as mentoring uh, startups as well on their journey. So I'm one of the mentors for Google Summer of Code, so I'm mentoring students currently on uh, some of their projects this year. So what I'm going to describe, I'm going to describe a bit about vulnerabilities. I'm sure you'll recognize some of the challenges. And then we're going to try and see how I think we can actually make life a little bit better for us. Um, key to that is sharing information. I'm going to introduce a project that's very new, and I would like you basically to be part of that and help us make that work for the community. And then a few conclusions. There's a lot to cover. I'm conscious of that. So hands up who remembers this. Can you remember what you were doing on the 9th of December, 2021? About quarter past three, I think, was when I saw the email. Um, and were you delighted? It's Friday afternoon, you just want to go home. And what about this one, which happened about Easter? Yes. So when your CISO or your engineering director says, are we impacted? Is that your normal reaction? More likely that. Not again. I still don't know. I still haven't got all that data that we said we were going to collect after Heartbleed or Wanna Cry or think about your greatest celebrity vulnerabilities. And why? Well, a lot of people say, well, it's not my problem to sort of vulnerabilities. It's not my software. Someone else will fix it for me. That's changing. If you're an integrator, you need to understand where your supply chain is. Those vulnerabilities could be all the way down, and you're taking some responsibility. You're delivering a solution. Just ignore it. You're not monitoring them. Who cares? Put it on that backlog, that ever-growing backlog. You never quite get to the top of that list. You may occasionally... Triage it and says, yeah, we might be using OpenSSL. Someone else will deal with it later. But what I think we really want is we should be practicing vulnerability management, which is analyze it, detail, analyze, communicate that analysis to your teams, to your customers. Yes, we're aware of it. We're going to sort it out or not. There's no issue. And then do the remediation. Make that remediation as important as some of these feature releases you all love doing. But the, what we're seeing, and we saw this on the previous presentation, software is complex. When I started, all the software, I could probably knew all the software that was in the system. I could probably speak to every developer all the way from an operating system through the middleware, through the databases, etc. I knew all the developers. That's not the case now. 
You don't know where your software's come from. It's a very big supply chain. Software doesn't build, isn't built now. We evolve software. We build using building blocks. That's very different. You start with somebody else's software and then build your application. And yes, you can't, I can barely see that. That's your typical complexity you have. You may have one component. Let's, this is a browser. But it depends on so many other components. Who's looking after all those components? The browser manufacturer looks after the top. Not all those dependencies. And those dependencies are used by other applications. So who's looking after all those interdependencies? And ultimately, it's about risk management. You can't manage something you don't understand. So you need to know what's inside it. Your products. So we need a way of describing software. And I think you know where this is going. We need to talk about software and a bill of materials. So hands up, who is using software bill of materials today? That's good, it's more than none. That. Who's consuming software bill of materials? That's a few, li little bit less. And any of those consumers in end user organizations? Even better, now down to one. Two, that's good. Same company, that was fine, big company. Okay, we need to be using software bill of materials and we're gonna explain why. So the way I define software bill of materials is through an analogy. Whenever you go to a restaurant, the first thing you ever guessed is, have you got any allergies? That's all about their risk management process. They don't want you to get ill and have an allergic reaction, which could be quite catastrophic to you. So they're trying to protect their business, their reputation. But really what they're looking at is, that's their supply chain. They've got salad, they've got meat. Where's that meat come from, the supply chain of that? That might, might be hiding other practices, probably a bit more remote. And what you also want is hopefully you want fresh ingredients that have been looked after and maintained in the fridge, for example. So what's the analogy with software? Your ingredients are frameworks, they are libraries, they are components, they are other organizations. What's the keeping them fresh? Are they under support? Have you got end of life, end of support, any end of life, end of support? When I go and get a burger, my son has a different burger. He doesn't have this salad. That's product configurations. Are you managing those product configurations? And what's the equivalent of allergic reaction? That's a vulnerability potentially leading to a date of exploit. So hopefully we understand the concept. So really what we want is we want something we can share. We want it in a machine readable form. We've talked about a lot the last two days about describing and documenting information. This is one of the ways, document it in a way that can be, can be consumed. Don't just write, get a document and put it in a shared folder and never read it. You want this to be actively read and consumed. And I want it to be shared within your organization as well as with your customers, with your supply chain. And it's part of risk. It's not just part of the technical structure. This is a risk management process that you need to be doing across your organization. Different parts of your organization have different insights they need to gain. And this has been going on for about 15 years. So the Linux Foundation, because of open source, the growth of open source, people needed to be more aware of the risk that licenses could be uh, abused or not managed. 
So they started looking at license management and they came up with software bill of materials. I don't know whether they crafted the name, but they launched something called SPDX. Um, a few years later, uh, Dependency Track was launched by OWASP, and that came from a business need that wanted to manage the risk of software and hardware components ahead of the game, because then that formed into what we now know as Cyclone DX, the other SBOM standard. And then government started getting interested. This is a big problem. We need to be involved. And you can start seeing we need to be more transparent, and we're seeing that increasingly in regulations. And then it got really exciting. 2020 solar winds. All the best vulnerabilities happened in December, in my view. Um, and that, I think, because of what it hit and who it hit, got people very interested. So you have the exec order coming from US government in May 2021. And that is the big catalyst for we need better transparency across all our software understand that supply chain. And that's probably given a big kick to the invest to the industry. We need to be aware of where our software is and where it's come from. And then log for j happened, log for shell. And if we'd have all got log had all the S-bombs at the time, we won't be spending thousands and thousands of hours working out are we affected and telling our customers, etc. We're still suffering from that event in December 2021. And then there's been various other initiatives to try and get more tooling, more awareness, etc. going various, various uh, initiatives, OpenSSF, the EU with the CRA, with the Cyber Resilience Act, the UK, because we're outside EU, has done something similar, etc. It is coming. S-bombs are starting to appear in more and more regulations or the, or the concept of S-bombs, might not be explicit, are, in, are required. And we talked about the previous session was all about the FDA. In October last year, the medical device market became a lot more stringent about the expectations of an S-bomb being made available to support their needs. And there were other requirements. Payment cards in April next year they need that transparency. They don't say explicitly SBOM, but it's the same concept. NIST 2 in the critical infrastructure, DORA, AI Act, they're all coming along. They all want the same level of information to manage that risk. And we've got two standards. Not ideal, but at least we've got standards. We've got content. We know what the content is. Let's focus on the content, not necessarily the format. It's more important getting that information available, and then we can share it. We'll get tools that can transform it. Through. I write some, I've got a library that allows you to transform it. That's what we need to do. Focus on the content rather than the format. But ultimately, all an S-bomb is, is three things. It's a bit of metadata. When was it created? Really important. And where it was created. Definition of a component, and a component could be a file, it could be a package, it could be another system. We'll see later on. And then it's the relationships between those components. And that's really important, because if you change one component, you want to see that traceability to see, well, what other components are affected if you change that. And we all like secure development life cycles, so you should be doing how an SBOM can be supporting all these decisions you are making in your secure development. Like when you're selecting a component, have you assessed your component? Do you know where it's come from? Is it being maintained? Is it vulnerable? Are there any vulnerabilities that are not being addressed? So these are things the SBOM is going to start helping you and you can use that within your development things so you can create and consume as part of your dev process. But it's not just developers. You need to get your GRC team on board. 
because they can also start getting views about the risk that you as an organization are exposing you to your customers to. So I see the, I see a lifecycle developer, supplier, integrator. Ultimately, the integrator could be doing a very big job of pulling things together. That integrator could be a car manufacturer, or it could be a medical device manufacturer, but he's pulling a thing from the whole supply chain. They need to have that overall picture. And this is a life cycle that I've, I've been promoting because I think one of the things is a lot of people, when they saw the exec order, they thought all they had to do was to create an S-bomb. And that, I think, was a real sh shame because actually creating them is the start of the process. It's like you write a piece of source code. That's not the end of the job. It's got to compile it and then in test it and then integrate it and then get it to work. Well, it's the same really with an S-bomb. You generate it. You've then got to analyze it. There's some valuable content in that. You should be looking at the content and seeing, is it telling me something I should be concerned about? Am I exposing myself to any risk? Is there a component that's not got a license? When I was running dev teams, I would not allow the dev team to take any component where the license was not determined. And then you're going to find some issues. Then you're going to have to prioritize those issues. And those issues are going to be dependent on your product requirements, your team, customers. And then you're going to remediate, fix, do whatever you do. And then you're back again. So CISO is going to be happy you've got a process that you're managing the risk. And hopefully it's an auditable process. We'll see that again. We want that to be auditable so you can see the traceability. So if issues ever happen, you've actually got a record to understand what, when things happened. And then you're going to get tools. And we've got some tools. So OWASP, uh, the dependency track was 10 years old last year. Um, it shows how it can fit in with all of your, all of your nice tools. It fits in with the ecosystems. It fits in with data. It's got, and it's going to feed into the, further down the supply chain and your development chain. So, Yes, there are tools there that can really show how this works if you've got the data. And there's lots of tools there to help you. Use these tools. These tools will fit into your pipeline. These tools will fit into your um, evaluation process, analysis. Just look at that. that. That is constantly changing. It's great to see that as a community. Some of the, it's focused on Cyclone DX. There are tools that also work with the other format. Some of my tools are on there as well. So go and have a look at them. A lot of them are open source, so it's not going to cost you anything. You can evaluate several products easily, and I will recommend you look at several tools. One tool is never just enough. And then these are the insights you're going to get. When you start looking at nest bombs, you're going to start seeing, maybe across your multiple dev teams, have you got multiple versions of the component? Different versions? Interesting. Let's look at the, the component. Is it being actively maintained? Go to the developer and says, are they actually maintaining the current? You know, are the issues sitting on their backlog and not being maintained, being updated? Is there any activity in the, in the repo? And are you starting to see vulnerabilities that are not being addressed? Is it vulnerable when you took it? Could you help fix the vulnerabilities? Um, but you should also be looking at your suppliers. Who are you dependent on? More important than what would happen if they disappeared? What would that do to you as a business, to your architecture, to your customers? And maybe if he's an open source developer, maybe you should be supporting them to make sure they may be encouraged not to disappear. And you must have a license policy in terms of most organizations will probably have a development policy. Are you policing that policy in terms of the licenses that you are using that you are allowed to be in your product? But ultimately, this is all about improving security and resilience. We all want that. We don't want the calls at 3 o'clock in the morning to say, 
we've had a security breach and you haven't got the data, you don't want that. And this is what we're trying to avoid. We all recognize this, and there's lots of these versions around. Lots of our systems are built like this. Could you identify any piece of software in your tech stack today and understand where it's come from, is it maintained, is it a risk if it disappeared, what would that happen to you and our products? So one of the things I, 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 I push is what's the quality of your S-bomb? Because one of the, there's two challenges. How do you know whether an S-bomb's complete? And secondly, how good is it? There are lots of tools out there. This is just one of the examples which actually has a benchmark. You look at them all and they're all different. So how do you know which is better? Well, it depends on your use cases. The one on the top left is my tool, and I, my view is put as much data in as possible. Because the more data you've got, the greater insight, insights you're going to get. But if you look across various tools, say for a container, you will get different views and different S-bombs for them. So never just use one, use multiple ones and see what they're telling you. And this is one of the challenges. US government, when they came up with their exec order, then defined a minimum set of um, data, metadata, that they wanted every component to have. And what we're seeing is the metadata isn't there for some of those components. Particularly, do we know where the components come from? Go back to my food analogy. Would you be happy if you didn't know where your meat came from when you're having your burger? Think about the same for software. If you don't know where your software's come from, that might be lurking. There may be some ed additional features in your software that, you, that hasn't been defined. Let's try and be more accurate, understand where that suppliers have come from, the supply chain. And I think supplier SBOM should be enriched with as much data as possible to give you that greatest view of confidence in your understanding your components. And as an example, there's a, in, there's a standard, the SBDX uh, community have a set of license identifiers for all these open sources. There's about five or six hundred. But when you go and look at the software in your, in your package managers, you find different ways of specifying the same license. So Apache 2, very common license, there's one official way of defining it, but there's so many different ways there's, there's actually uh, included in the ecosystem. So if open source developers are here, try and make sure we are getting the metadata to be high quality. Because that's going to help people when they're trying to assess the components. And another really big issue is naming of components. So NIST and MITRE have, have defined components using C, what they call CPEs, it's NIST. Um, but one of the challenges they have is they have a, a vendor and a package name. Now vendors change, vendors get, someone uh, gets bought out by another company. Well, is it still that company or is it the new company name? So sometimes component names can get massaged. Sometimes they're not very accurate in terms of the way they name the package or they're not very consistent. And when you have something like OpenSSL, when there's lots of different versions of things like OpenSSL, depending on which ecosystem it is, that gets really hard when you're trying to use this as a way to identify your component and then start doing risk management against it, vulnerability management. So an alternative is something called Perl, um, which Cyclone DX heavily supports. And that's a different way of identifying a package in a way that allows you to give a little bit more context. So it says it's, in this case, it's a Python version. 
Well, that narrows your vulnerability management down to a, a little bit more focus than it's just it's a, a, a package. I wish the S, S bombs really is brought part of a family. Um, so although we've got F software, you've got hardware bill of materials, and in the world of engineering, hardware bill of materials have been around for a long, long time. Um, so generally, our software lives as part of a system. We saw that in the previous talk about medical devices. So software has dependencies to hardware. Increasingly, software uses APIs into your cloud, software as a service. But then we've also then got probably other things like cryptography. Well, CBOM, which has recently been added to the Cyclone DX, is defining what type of crypto you're using, the algorithms you're using. And of course, you've got AI. So you've got MLBOM, which is defining the AI model and the data associated with that ML. Um, or AI model. So you're actually pulling it all together and ultimately you have an OBOM, which is your product. I come from System of Systems. An OBOM is a System of Systems, which pulls all this together and ultimately you should be delivering a system, an OBOM. That could be quite a complex beast when you think about a car. Think about all the components coming together from all the suppliers and all the supply chains. That's where we need to be getting to, to provide all the traceability. Medical device has probably most of this. The previous session saw this. You'd end up putting that together. So this is where we are. Software is just part of the, the journey. And there's some really excellent guides. So when Cyclone DX got upgraded in April, they associated with a number of really excellent guides. So if you want to understand the use cases that are being considered, look at these guides, really great, ex great examples. I know the focus on the examples of Cyclone DX probably, probably also apply for any use of S-bombs or uh, in the bill of materials. So, and feel in if they contribute to that and make it better for the community. And S-bombs are part of a bigger supply chain. So you want to have integrity in that supply chain. So you've got things like Salsa, which is software supply chain, uh, Assurance, um, which is quite an onerous process, looking at all the way through your build process and uh, checks throughout to, that's to try and address some of the challenges. We saw things like the solar winds being uh, injections into your repos. But then you've also got something called VEX, which is where I want to talk about that now, which is about how you manage your vulnerabilities. Hands up who thinks we can ever write vulnerable free software. Ooh, vulnerable free, that, okay. Very few. It's really hard because our software is too complex. But whenever we release some software, do you release the known def uh, uh, acknowledge there are some defects? And are you communicating that to your customer? This is what VEX is trying to do. So you develop an S-bomb, you've got a set of components with a set of versions. Those components may have vulnerabilities, but you may have assessed them to say they are not material and do not offer any issue to your use of your, of your product. Maybe the vulnerability is in a part of a component that you're not using. So when you're getting your SEA tools and scanning and they're saying you've got a vulnerability, you probably want to say, that's not true, it's a false, it's, it's, it, I've assessed it and it's not, I don't need to change it, so you can take it off the backlog. That's what VEX is trying to do. But vulnerabilities are happening all the time, so you need to be doing this all the time because you're not releasing an S-bomb every day. You're doing an S-bomb as a baseline. 
but people need to be communicated. So when we get the next celebrity vulnerability like for Shell, you're able to communicate that information back to your customers quickly to say, yes, that vulnerability, we're aware of it, we've assessed it, and it's not going to be uh, exploited in our instance of your product. Or maybe it is, but you need to communicate that. So we currently have four standards. So we have two standards for S-bombs. We've now got four standards for VEX. And we've also got things, uh, how you disclose vulnerabilities, VDR, possibly. Um, so Cyclone DX has a way of describing vulnerabilities. You can include it in an S-bomb. I would recommend you include it separately as a separate S-bomb, a separate artifact. Um, but you've also got something called CSAF, um, which is a standard, an ISO standard. You've got OpenVex, which is a very simple standard. And you've got SPDX, which has just introduced uh, a way of describing vulnerabilities. Ultimately, what he's trying to define is the status of that vulnerability and some justification. So have you looked at the, the vulnerability? Have you assessed it? Have you determined whether it is something you need to do to fix? and make that communicable within your wider supply chain. So in Cyclone DX, Cyclone DX you have six status. So the default is in triage. I'm looking at it. And then you're going to say, I've assessed it. I don't need to do anything with it, which is the not affected or false positive. Or there's something I need to do with it, it is exploitable, or it's being resolved and it's fixed in this version, etc. You need to do this for every vulnerability that's reported against your bill of materials. And then you then the justification for the not affected, and, and Cyclone DX is very extensive in this compared to the other standards, it gives you nine reasons of why you think it's not exploitable. If you look at those, those are really good guidance in terms of what you should be doing in your dev process to try and mitigate your attack surface. Are you taking a big uh, a, a, a library and are you building it with all the options or are you building it with only the options you need for your application, try and minimize that attack surface. So I find these are really good ways of a check. Have you mitigated some, some of your risk as part of your development process? And then you need to sort of provide some audit trail to demonstrate you are doing your compliance. We're seeing increasingly a number of regulations that require you to demonstrate you're doing a secure development life cycle. You're doing these testing, you're doing these reviews. Well, let's part, start putting those and documenting them in a way that can be consumed electronically rather than just sending an email or putting in a document that nobody reads. Let's make this shareable and substantiate it with the evidence. So, yeah, this was done. And by whom? Which comes down to the next bit set, the final session is, we've got this valuable information. How do we share it? Because we need to share it amongst the community and our customers. So welcome to Project Koala. Ollie over here in the front row, he's one of the project leads. Um, to try and demonstrate this, and basically, because we recognize we need to work a better way of sharing this information. And we've... We want to share information such as discovering the art, discovering an artifact, an S bomb, a VEX, pub, um, storing it, retrieving it, etc., allowing us to make decisions. And the sort of thing we want to share is S bombs and VEX, but we want to make this extensible because there's more and more of these inf bits of information people need to make decisions. So these are the sort of things you might want to use uh, an organization to use, obviously publish standard life cycle of, a, of an artifact. But consumer wants to make dis decisions. So 
before I go and buy this router, I maybe want to go and get the SBOM of the router to look at how up-to-date is it. I need to discover it. And don't forget, a consumer could also be an organization, so these use cases could be, you could be both sides of the, uh, the equation. Basically, very simple, you're going to get publishers, you're going to have something storing it, and you're going to have consumers retrieving information. Very simple. But you need a server that can control all this. Some of the challenges is we've got to think about is how you identify things, and that's quite hard. That's a big challenge that we have, because we've also got to make sure it's secure. So we can't have something that's very derivable, such that you could then access a product just by its name and its version. That means anybody could. You don't, might not want that, because you want to protect proprietary information in some cases, or restrict the information. And then this is where a case of how much information do we store? Do we just store the document, or do we store it in down to real grand, uh, fine, fine level? Currently, I think it's at the top level. Basically, it's just an artifact. In future, that may change and can become more detailed. But that simple, start simple. And then you need access control, recognizing that you may want different access controls depending on what the content is. Maybe open source is less, needs to be less protected than something that's got very proprietary information or very sensitive information. But then you can see what the benefit of something like this might be in terms of the ecosystems, language ecosystems. They can become publishers of this information, which will allow us giving consistency of the metadata, which helps the, the, increases the quality of the data that's being shared in the community. And then you can see how our, our things like dependency track could be used to actually add to um, Project Koala's API and can see how it works together. But one thing we need to think about comes back to the comes back to the analogy at the beginning. How do we share end of life information? That's something that I think is a, is a real issue as a community. There are things now starting. Let's get involved in that and make sure that works for everybody. So let's now summarize. What I've really been describing is what the OWASP SBOM Forum is doing. This was stood up in the last year. Um, Tom Alwick has written a book to share a lot of our experiences. I encourage you to get involved in it. We meet at um, 6 o'clock Portuguese time and whatever time that is in your, the rest of Europe. Um, it has to fit in with the US because it's heavily US driven in terms of the community. I encourage you to, draw, to join it. I won't marry this tonight, but please do, join if you, in the future. There's also ECMA to try and standardize what Cyclone DX is doing, what Project Koala is doing, what Perl are doing. We want these to be standards in the community and recognized. And we also want, I want SBOMs to be there as the point of managing your risk. There's a lot of information. The sooner you start using them, the sooner you are going to manage your risk. Share them, use them, but realistic would be about vulnerabilities. They're not going to be zero. I don't think we're ever going to get zero vulnerable software, but let's try and make it better so we can share and understand the right vulnerabilities. So we've summarized that. Thank you. There's a link to my um, GitHub. Uh, please join me. It's lonely on my own sometimes, building these software. Um, make some software. There's some libraries. There's a library for SBOMs, a library for VEX. I abstract them into a data model so the format becomes less, interest, less of a, an issue. Please join me and make, make it better for the community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. If anyone would like to, uh, uh, you can go up to the mic. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you're talking a lot about managing risk, and risk is based okay, likelihood, impact. Is there in the BOM ecosystem, the slide you presented earlier, somewhere where you can capture the impact of 
uh, an exploit on a vulnerability, or must this be managed outside in a GRC or whatever? So, um, you can capture things like the CVSS score, an EPSS score, can be captured within the S-bombs. No, it's not really CVSS, it's the, the impact for the organization. Okay. Like, okay, if this application gets exploited, I lose $1 million. If this one is being exploited, I'm in breach of my regulations. Okay. Um, not explicitly. But the, the Cyclone DX standard allows you to, def to define uh, additional properties. So you can use those additional properties to capture that information, to communicate that information. Um, but yeah, it's, I can see that, that the, standard, the standard can evolve. If you find there's a need for that, the, 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 you know, maybe that should be a, a future addition. But yeah, it's user defined properties is the best way to do that currently. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to get your opinion on, um, so when we try to create Zbomb for our products, we use tools like Black Duck and others that, you know, just produce open source Zbomb, right? But we're also interested in the uh, commercial components, which nobody seems to, you know, adequately produce. So what, what's the right answer here? My view is you need to try and capture as much as possible. Um, every tool has strengths, every tool has weaknesses. Um, I used to recommend to developers compile your software at least three times using three different compilers because you'll get maybe three different parsers, but you know, the parsers will be different. I would recommend you do the same with the S-bombs, generate it multiple times for multiple tools um, and validate it yourself. Um, don't rely on AI probably to do it for you as well. You know, include the human uh, I, I'll give you an example. I looked at a container. Um, the tool said one thing. I went inside the container and I got a completely different set of data because it was missing some of the data. So be very aware that that's... And, and also some suppliers say that, you know, scanning your binaries is more effective because they can, you know, you can extract the bomb from what actually deployed versus scanning the source code. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, the binaries will give you some more context. The source, just on the source code, you miss a lot of context. So there's S-bombs throughout the life cycle. So really the ones that are most valuable are the ones that get deployed onto your, onto your target system. Um, reverse engineering an S-bomb from a binary is very hard and very expensive currently. Um, community, would you like to join me to try and fact that problem? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Came here a bit at random and turned out to be one of the best talks I've seen at this conference today. Question, uh, assuming you've seen a couple of uh, success stories regarding implementing a, an SBOM program, who do you see as the crucial roles in an organization? So definitely there's uh, value for uh, risk management, but I'm assuming this is like a let's keep our house tidy program, not just security, so who should be the evangelist in an organization in order to make things work? So given the importance of regulation, I think the leadership team needs to be very aware of what's hiding. So clearly the CISO or whoever at that level should be taking this as part of his remit to try and improve the resilience and the security of their organization. And I would like that to be proactive. I think we see a lot of reactive work in security. I think if you started looking at this, you will start under uncovering a lot of things you didn't realize. And visibility, it's not a case of trying to use it as a witch hunt to say, dev teams haven't been telling me things. Actually, as an organization, share your risks, share your concerns. So yes, the risk team, yes, the dev team, yes, the product team, yes, the marketing team, everybody has a role to play to make security a problem, or, or, or to, to address the security problem. Thanks. 
Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, how do you see VEX or anything else in this ecosystem solving the problem of lowest common denominator in the sky industry? For example, if you're a medium-sized software vendor, you do all the great work, you produce boom, you maybe start using VEX, but your customers have some kind of stupid scanner that's running that says you are vulnerable to this and that, and I don't care that you've done all the good analysis, I want you to fix it, so my scanner shuts up. How do you solve this problem of being forced to do prioritization by the stupidest scanner in the industry? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, this is all about partnership. The supply chain is not A passes to B, passes to C. We're all part of that ecosystem. We need to share. Yeah. We all solve problems, share as a community, educate your customers, which is hard, totally agree, it's hard. Educate the regulators, which is why I don't like fix every vulnerability that's high or se severe, which I used to see, and then it says, what do you mean by high and severe? Oh, it's this. Well, that doesn't define the context. So you please educate. This is coming. We can see this is, there's a, it's hitting us, it's going to hit us very hard. The CRA is going to make a real big change. So actually start preparing now. Start talking to your customers and say, we want to make the software better for you. How are you going to work with us to do that? It's not easy, but let's start that dialogue. Because whoever starts first is going to make market advantage pay. Be an early adopter. I think you'll get ahead before everyone's suddenly struggling and they then suddenly say, well, I can't put my product on the market now until I fix it. That's an opportunity. Take the opportunity now. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, please give, give Anthony another round of applause.